Thank you for joining us for today's message. We believe we can go anywhere in the world from right here in Lamarck, Texas and reach people just like you. If you'd like more information about Abundant Life, please visit ALCC.org. You can also text the number below if you would like to support the church financially. Be ready for a powerful message that's gonna impact your life. This is something that, that I know God's been speaking to me about. And, and so oftentimes that's what you guys get, just whatever, whatever's hitting in my world. So um, <clears throat> the Bible says in Philippians 127, it says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ only to believe in him, but, or not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you have been going through the same struggle you saw that I had, and now hear that I still have. Okay, so Paul at this time was imprisoned. Uh, they say he was like attached to a Roman guard, like he was, he was just, he was locked up. And he's writing to these other people who have it bad, and he's saying, look, I know what you're going through. I feel what you feel. I've been where you've been. And he said, look, we're both going through it at the same time. And, and what he's doing is he's speaking hope because he's saying, listen, don't look at the people who oppose you and be afraid. He said, know that if they're opposing you, that it's a sign of their destruction, but it's also a sign of your salvation. And man, I like that. I think that's a good word for somebody because that means if somebody's coming against you, and, and I'm going to hit on that in a little bit, but look, that means that God is about to do something big in your world. Uh, you know, they, I, was, I was reading uh, some stuff about Oprah a while back, and I know Oprah is not around as, as in the same way that she used to be. You know, when she had a daily show and she did different things, but um, they said that Oprah almost 99% of the time, of all the thousands and thousands of people that she's interviewed over the years, almost every single one, she says, almost every single person, as soon as the interview was done, they came to her and they said, was that okay? Like, did I do okay? They constantly were asking, like, how did I do? Was it okay? And, and what they were doing is they were looking for that reassurance. They were looking for her to tell them, hey, it was okay. You did good. Because, watch, when you're in the presence of somebody that's great at what they do, you get a little, you get a little nervous. Your confidence can be rocked a little bit. And I am, I'm a very confident person. I have no problem saying that. I am extremely confident in everything that I do. I'm, I'm a I'm that kind of person. I, I don't have a problem with confidence. Humility sometimes, confidence never. Like, I'm working on it. But I can step into places and be very confident. I know who I am. I know who I am in Christ. And so I can go into places. But, but when, I'm, when, when I speak, like up here, almost all the time, if Catherine's in the room, as soon as I'm done, I'm in a, it's a vulnerable state up here. You're in a vulnerable position. And so I'll always come down and I'm like, was that okay? Did I do good? And, and I'm just looking for that reassurance. And, and I feel like I did good. I, it sounded like I did good, but I still need that word. Why? Because I always, no matter how confident you are, you always need a little bump in your confidence. Because confidence is, is a huge thing in your world. Look, if you're confident, it changes how you act. And watch this, it changes how you react. Uh, I don't know if anybody watched the Astros this week, watched them win last night, which was kind of cool. It was a big deal. Um, you know, I, I love, <laughs> I love that, that we're going back to the World Series, man. That's a cool thing. I like being in a city where they got winning teams. And, and, and I noticed something in watching baseball. We watch a lot of sports in our house. We watch baseball and football and basketball, all kinds of things. And, and you can tell, you know, a pitcher when, when something happens in the first or second inning and they get, their team gets some runs on the board, if, if Verlander's pitching or Garrett Cole or whoever, and, and they have three runs and it's three to zero in the, you know, in the first or second inning, it changes the way they play. It changes how they pitch. It changes their strategy. Why? Because they're more confident standing on the mound. If you've got a quarterback that their defense just scored a touchdown on an interception, the next time they get the ball, they've got more confidence. Why? Because they have the power behind them. They feel like they've got something good behind them, and that's the reality in your life. If you can be confident, 
If you can get some confidence in your world, if you can hold on to something that you say, I am confident in this, it changes how you live. It changes how you, how you parent your children. It changes how you work in your job. It changes how you just walk and react and talk. It's important to, to have confidence. It's so important. Uh, I, I, you know, I like when, when I work out and I go to the gym with, with friends of mine that are big and strong. Like, I'm a pretty big guy. I'm, you know, I'm okay. I'm strong enough. But, man, I've got some friends that when they walk into a gym, people are, like, taking pictures because these guys are just shredded. And, and I like going to the gym with them because, first of all, I'm like, there's nobody that's going to mess with me. You know, like, I'm walking around with these guys, and I walk a little bit different when I'm with somebody. You know, I've got a friend of mine that was a professional boxer, and anytime we would go somewhere, I was just like, man, let's go. Like, I'm looking for a fight because I'm like, I'm just going to stand back and watch this dude do what he does. Like, I'm like, I it's just how I live. And watch, that's how we ought to be all the time. That's how we ought to step into every attack that the enemy comes against us with. Why? Because you've got a professional fighter walking beside you in everything that you do. God is the king of kings. He's the champion of champions. He's the fighter that never loses. And so you've got to have that kind of confidence in everything that you do. You've got to walk around like you cannot lose. Here's the reality. If you can win within, if you can win within, then all you have to do is win within. If you can win on the inside, if you can get that mindset and that confidence that, hey, I can win, I can do this, I can overcome, that's all you need in your life. You just need to believe that you are able. Watch this. If you already know the outcome, the opponent doesn't matter. That's a good word for somebody right there. Because watch this, if we really believe that God has already given us the victory, then it doesn't matter if cancer shows up. It doesn't matter if bankruptcy shows up. It doesn't matter if divorce shows up. It doesn't matter if depression shows up. It doesn't matter if failure shows up or loss shows up. It doesn't matter what the opponent is. If you really believe that you've already won the victory, then the opponent is just a name. It's just another battle. It's just another step. It's just another uh, place where you step up to get to your ultimate victory. If you already believe, if you know the outcome, the opponent doesn't matter because you're already a winner. David lived like that. David stepped into every battle knowing that he was already a champion. He was already an overcomer. He was already a winner. He said, when I fought the lion, I killed the lion. When I fought the bear, I killed the bear. When the giant stood in front of me, I already knew that he was going to be laying on the ground. So I wasn't worried about the giant. If you know the outcome, the opponent does not matter. Look, at it, in your life, you don't have to convince God that you're a winner. He's already called you a winner. You don't have to convince the enemy, the devil. You don't have to convince him that you're a winner. He already knows you're a winner. You know who you have to convince? You have to convince yourself. You've got to convince you that you're a winner. You've got to convince you that you're good enough. You've got to convince you that you are going to make it, that you're going to be okay. You're going to overcome this. You're going to get through this. Because the day that you believe it, the God already believes it. The enemy is already afraid of it. But the day you believe it, that's when it becomes reality. That's when it steps into your world and you're able to walk in that victory. But if we're constantly saying, well, I don't know, maybe someday, I don't know if God's going to be able to do it. God's already done it. It's already happened. We just have to step into what he's already done. You have to convince yourself that you're good enough, that you're going to make it. There was a man in the Bible, Gideon. Gideon was, was uh, they say he was threshing wheat in a, in a wine press. He was underground doing the job that you had to have wind to do. So he was in an enclosed space where there was no wind, but he was trying to make the, the wheat and the chaff get, get separated. He was doing the right job in the wrong place. Why? Because he was afraid. He was hiding from his enemy. And God speaks to him in that place. And God says, oh, Gideon, mighty man of God, mighty man of valor, great warrior. And Gideon was like, yo, I think you're talking to the wrong person. Like, that's the other Gideon in the town. He's, he's two doors down, God. You made a mistake. Like, that's, that's what Gideon said. He's like, no, not me. He's like, you must not know who I am. He said, I'm the lowest person in my house, and my house is the lowest person in our clan, and our clan is the lowest clan in all of the kingdom. He said, we're nobodies. We're the bottom of the barrel. We're the worst of the worst. He said, God, you must be making a mistake. But watch, God doesn't make mistakes. Why? Because God was not talking about who Gideon was. He was talking about who Gideon was supposed to be. 
where he was supposed to go, who he was supposed to be. Look, God does that in your life. God does not speak to who you are. God speaks to who you really are. Maybe you just don't know it yet. Maybe you haven't convinced yourself of it yet. The enemy knows. You don't think the devil knows how great you are? You don't think the devil knows how powerful you are? Of course he knows. That's why he's bringing an attack against you to try and get you focused on that instead of on the greatness that's already living on the inside of you. It's already there. You don't have to beg God to make you great. You're already great. You just have to recognize it and step into it. And the day that you do that, I'm telling you, there's nothing that will be able to stand in your way. No attack will be able to stand. Why? Because you are already great. That's what Gideon was. Gideon was great on the inside. But watch, he'd been told his entire life that he was worthless, that he was no good, that he was never going to make it, never going to be anything. And so what did he do? When God spoke to him and told him that he was great, Gideon began, watch this, to filter everything that God said through everything he'd already heard. So God was telling him he was great, but he was filtering that through his, you know, knucklehead cousin telling him that he was worthless. God was telling him he was going to be a, a mighty man of valor, but he was filtering it through his father telling him that he was weak and he was no good. Watch, we do that same thing. We filter the, the commands of God and the blessings of God and the, and the love of God and the grace of God and the forgiveness of God. And we filter that through all of our past experiences, all of our past conversations, and all of our past mess ups. And so now the time, by the time it gets through all of the nonsense from our past, the love of God is dulled in our life. Why? Because we filter it out. But if you can remove the filter and say, I don't care where I've been. I don't care what I've done. It doesn't matter. Why? Because God already chose me. God already picked me out of the crowd. God already told me how great I was, even though I used to not be so great. And that's where Gideon was. And Gideon argued with God. And I got a great word for you tonight. Don't argue with God when he starts telling you how great you are. Just agree with him. Just agree with him. Just say, you know what, God, you're right. I am pretty great. Look, you got to start doing that. Look, if somebody gives you a compliment, go ahead and receive the compliment. Go ahead and receive it. I, you know, I, I do that sometimes. If somebody ever gives me a compliment, I kind of like, oh, shucks, you know. Like, I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. And I try and, like, I try and swerve that compliment and, and try and flip it or something or tell them oh, I'm not really, you know. I stop doing that. I stop doing that. And I know I shouldn't, I know, because again, I told you I'm, I'm confident but not as humble as I need to be. I'm working on it, and I, I try and be humble. And Why? Because now, from now on, when somebody compliments me, I just say, thank you. I agree. I think I am pretty great. <laughs> I am. I think so. Somebody said, man, you look like a great father. I said, yeah, I'm the best father. I am. It's true. You know, like, I'm not, I'm not being like a, a jerker. But watch, I had to learn how to receive a compliment. Because I'd spent so many years trying to flip it and say, ah, I don't know about that. You know, I mean, there's a hundred better fathers than me. Not anymore. I'm like, you bet I'm great. Why? Because if they think it, why don't I think it? Why can't I receive? I do the same thing if somebody walks up and tries to give me money. I used to be like, oh, no, no, I'm good, I'm good. You keep your money. Not anymore. And that pastor, one of the most generous human beings I've ever been around in my life. Every once in a while, we'll be sitting at lunch, and he'll just open his wallet and throw me a hundred dollar bill. Just slide it across the table. Sometimes he'll throw me $200. I used to be like, no, Pastor, I can't receive. I can't take that. No, no, no. Not anymore, man. I got, well, now I got kids, so I'm like, no, man. Come on. I know you've got more in there. Let's go. I, I got no problem. I was like, nah, there's three kids. I need at least three plus one for me. <laughs> but I'm like, no, nah, man, I used, to, I used to be like, oh, no, I can't take that. Not anymore. Uh-uh. Why? Because, man, I'm not, watch this, I'm not going to rob somebody else of their blessing. If they're trying to bless me, you try and bless me, I believe God's going to bless you. That seed that you're sowing, now I'm not asking you to give me money, don't do that. I don't need your money, don't do it. But I am just saying you've got to learn how to receive a blessing. Because there's going to be people that are going to come to you and try and bless you and try and compliment you. And watch, if you just push it away, push it away, push it away, pretty soon, because you're trying to be humble, because you're trying to push it, pretty soon you're going to believe what you say when you're trying to push away their compliment because you're embarrassed to receive it. 
Don't be embarrassed to receive it. Because watch, if you're embarrassed to receive it from somebody else, pretty soon you'll be embarrassed to receive it from God. And you'll begin to argue with God like Gideon did. And Gideon said, I'm not good enough. And God said, no, sir, you are more than good enough. That's what God says about you. That's what I love about our, our teen ministry, our youth ministry with Darian and myself and, and our team in there. Darian spoke this last week, and I love it because every time either one of us speak, anytime anybody is in our youth ministry speaking to the teenagers, we tell them how great they are. We tell them how successful they're going to be. We tell them how much they're loved. And they may not hear that at home, and they may not hear that at school, but I promise every time they step into our building and get around us, we're going to tell them that they're great, and they're going to be great, and they're going to do great things. Why? Because if we don't tell them who's going to, and I think sometimes we're like, oh, yeah, it's great when you tell teenagers that, but, but you don't have to tell me. But, no, I do have to tell you because so many of us forgot how to dream. We forgot how to use our imagination and believe that our lives can be more than just going to work and watching TV and going to sleep and doing it all over again. Our lives can be greater than where we are right now. And Gideon was there, and he was talking to God. <coughs> Excuse me. And God was talking to him, and Gideon was filtering God's blessing through all of the things that others have said. Watch this. When other people criticize you, okay, any external criticism only will affect you to the point that your insecurities allow it to, okay? Any criticism from the outside, I'm going to say it one more time, any criticism from the outside will only affect you to the point that your insecurities allow it to. That means if you're insecure in an area, if you've got some sort of hitch in your world in any certain area, when somebody criticizes anything close to that area, all of a sudden it attaches to you. And then it makes it worse because now that insecurity gets worse. And so what you've got to do is you've got to find those places where you're insecure. You've got to find those places where you feel like you're missing it a little bit. And that's where you need to be strong. That's where you need to focus. Because the enemy knows where you're insecure. He knows where you're weak. He knows where the chink is in your chain. And the enemy will go to that place and he will attack. Watch Diablo, the name for the devil. It literally means to, to shoot like an arrow or a dart. And to hit time after time after time after time. And he'll keep hitting that spot until a weakness is shown. And then it'll hit the weakness time after time until it cracks. And then it'll hit the crack until it splits and until a hole is there. And then he attacks. That's the way the enemy works. So if he can find an area in your life where you're insecure, where you're weak, he will criticize that area until it breaks. And here we are. The apostle Paul, and he is talking and he says, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, those who come against you, he said, don't be afraid why? Because he said this is a sign to them. If they're opposing you, if somebody's coming against you, it is a clear sign that their destruction is on the way. But not only of that, but he said also that you are about to have salvation coming from God. He said, look, you've got to recognize that if somebody's attacking you, it's not because you've done something wrong. It's because you've done something right. That that means your salvation is on the way. God is about to show up in a big way, but also those who come against you are about to be destroyed. Why? Because there are none that can stand against the power of God. None that can come against God and forever stand. They will fall to their feet. And Paul, what he's doing is Paul is giving the gift of empathy. Okay? He's giving the gift of empathy. And he's saying the same way that you struggle... I struggle. He said, the same places where you're weak, I'm weak. The same problems you've had, I've had. He said, look, man, I am chained to a Roman guard. He, got, he said, I got chains. Every time I'm writing, I'm moving his hand with mine because we're chained together. We're locked up together. And he said, man, I don't know how bad it is for you, but that's how bad it is for me. I feel your pain. I know that the struggle is the same. He said, we're both in it together. Watch this. Sometimes in your life, you will get comfort in your situation. You will get comfort from God in your world. Watch this. So that you can give other people empathy. He said, I don't even know what empathy is. Two words. Sympathy and empathy, right? Two different words. Sympathy means I see what you're going through. Sympathy says... Watch this, I feel for you, 
I see what you're going through. Empathy says, I, or somebody says, I see it. Empathy says, I feel it. I feel what you're going through. I feel your pain. I feel your struggle. And that's what Paul was saying. Paul said, listen, I feel your struggle. I feel your pain. Watch this, the church forever, not our church, but just the church in general, general statement of the church. The church forever has been known really for two words. Those two words are you should, thou shalt. You should, right? You should do this. You should do that. You should go here. You should do this. Watch, you should not do this. You should not go there. You should not be this. You should not see them. The church is, is, is branded by that kind of statement. You should. You should. And what does that do? That's kind of a bad statement. I mean, it's, it's necessary sometimes, but it's kind of a bad place. Why? Because the you shoulds, it, it's a separation. It said, I'm right. You've obviously done something wrong, so you should do better. You should not go there. You should. But watch. You know what the church really stands for? What the church's statement really is? It's not a you should. The church's real statement is a me too. Me too. You struggle? Me too. You feel pain? Me too. You've made mistakes? Me too. You've failed before? Me too. That's what the church says. Watch, because there's nobody in this building who's perfect. Nobody in this building who's never made a mistake. Nobody in this building who's never failed. There's nobody in this place who said, I am above it all. I've never done it. Watch, every one of us has had a problem. Every one of us has had a past. I love it. I follow a guy on Instagram, and they've got these, these shirts that I want to buy. And the shirt says, every saint has a past, and every sinner has a future. And I like that because it's true. It puts us on a level playing field. That look, we've got pasts, but they've got a future. There's some hope for them, and there's hope for us. Why? Because we got out of what we used to be. We're not there anymore. Thank God that we had it past, but we've also got somewhere to go. But every sinner who is in their past, they're in their problem, they've got a future. And I love that. And I love that the church, we are a me too church. I hurt, I struggle, I feel pain, me too. I can empathize with you because we've all been there. Maybe not in the same exact situation. But we've all made mistakes. And that's what I love about God because in Philippians 2, the Bible says that Jesus, he did not think it was bad to be an equal with God. But what did he do? The Bible says he stepped down from heaven and he put upon him the form of a human, of a man, and he came into the weakness of flesh. And it said that he died. He, he submitted himself to death, not just any death, but the most humiliating, painful death, the death on the cross. And the Bible says that he did all of this for us. Roman I mean, Hebrews chapter 4, it says that we do not have a high priest who cannot empathize with our weaknesses, who cannot empathize with us, but we have, we, uh, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just like us, yet it says he did not sin. And I love that. I love that we don't have some God who's, who's up in heaven looking down at us and saying, man, it must be bad down there. That's got to be terrible what they're dealing with. No, you know what we do? We have a God who, who walked off of the stairway of heaven. We don't have a God who stands on top of the stage and says, oh, man, look how bad it is down there. It must be rough. You know what we do? We have a God who stepped off of the stage and came down, and he said, man, it's tough, right? I know, man, me too. It is tough. I went through it. You're going through it. But it's okay because I got over it so you can get over it. We have a God who gets in the middle of who we are, gets in the middle of our situation and says, I feel it too. He's not saying, oh, man, you should. He said, me too. I've hurt too. I've been deserted too. I've been abandoned too. I've lost friends too. I had my best friend stab me in the back too. I felt pain too. I felt lost too. Me too. He empathizes with us. And it says because of this in Hebrews, it says because of this that we can go to the throne of God. And we can walk right up to the throne of God with what? Confidence. With confidence. Why? Because in Christ, right? In Christ, when he steps into the middle of our situation, watch this. We share in his struggle and we have access to his strength. 
Watch, because when he struggled, right, he took our guilt and our shame and our sin. And so the struggle we've shared But when he took our sin and took our guilt and took our shame, he gave us his strength. He gave us his passion. He gave us his grace. He gave us his hope. Everything he took from us, he filled that void with something better. And we can can share the struggle, but we partner in the strength. And that's what God has given us, the ability The ability to be strong in our weakness. And because he stepped out of heaven, because he stepped into the earth, because he stepped into our lives, we now can access him at any time. I love it. I love that we don't have to show up in this building at the right time for God to speak into our lives, for us to have a move of God. You can have a move of God on the way home. You can have a move of God in the bathtub. You can have a move of God everywhere you go, anything you do. You can have a move of God at your job, in the grocery store, sit in line at Starbucks. You can have a move of God wherever you are. Why? Because he stepped out of heaven and said, I'm in it too, and we can do it together. We can be strong together. We suffer together. And now we can overcome together. That's what God has said to us. That's the power of God. And why did he do that? Why did he struggle? Why did he suffer? So he could give us strength. So we could walk with confidence. So that when the enemy attacks, I say, man, I'm not scared. I'm not scared of you, devil. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid anymore. Why? Because I've seen the attack. And you know what? I have a strength that's not like anybody else's strength because it's not me anymore. I can walk with a new confidence. Why? Because the battle's already been won. It doesn't matter what opponent I face. I've already won. It doesn't matter what challenge comes against me. I've already won. Why have I already won? I've already won because he's already won. Because he already won. Because of that, we have access to something so much better. The power, the same power that raised Jesus from the grave, that pulled our Lord out of the clutches of sin and death and shame and hurt and pain and brokenness, the same power that ripped him out of the grave and blew the stone off of the door, that same power is available for you in every moment of your life. Not just when you're in church, not just when you pray in the Holy Ghost, not just when you do right, not just when you tithe, not just when you offer, not just when you say, man, God, I got it all together. Every moment of your life, that power's there. It's accessible. It's available. God is desperate to put it in your world. All you've got to do is receive that power and walk in the confidence that you can stand in. Because he got up out of the grave, you can get up out of your situation. You know what the devil wants you to do? The devil wants you to be crushed under the weight of what's come against you. He wants to crush you under that doctor's report. He wants to crush you under that debt. He wants to crush you in that marriage that's broken. He wants to crush you in the relationship with your children that's fractured. He wants to crush you in the inability to get work. He wants to crush you in the inability to be in a relationship, whatever it is you're facing. The enemy wants to crush your life and keep you down. But because God got up, because God rose from the grave, because God got out of the ground, you can get up today. You can stand and put your head up and stick your chest down and say, I'm going to make it. I'm going to be okay. I don't have to suffer. I don't have to be in pain anymore. I may be chained to a Roman guard, but I'm going to be okay because I understand that every person that comes against me is not coming against me. They're coming against him. And that is a sign to me that I'm going to be saved. And it's a sign to them that they're going to lose. When you have that faith, that you say, I can't lose. I can't lose. It's impossible. I like playing games with my boys right now. I like fighting with them. Because I'm so much stronger than they are. 
and they're weak. There's two of them, and they're weak. And I love it because I can just push them away. And I'm taking advantage of that now because it won't be long that two against one is going to get unfair in my world. And you know what? I love it because it's a perfect picture of Christ. That watching our weakness, he is strong. Because a lot of times in my house, it's two on one, two boys versus mercy. And mercy's pretty strong, but those boys both weigh as much as she does. And they're two years younger. And they're just, they're rough. And she says daddy one time, and it's two on two. And it's a different world when I'm involved. It's a different world. And watch, that's how God is. Because watch, the enemy comes against you and the odds look impossible. And it looks like you're going to be defeated and you just ought to put up with getting busted. You ought to just live with it. But you know what? You don't have to. All you got to do is cry out. Say, Dad, I need help. Dad, help me. And all of a sudden, the dad, the father in your world that is so much bigger and so much stronger that the enemy could send everything he's got and in one swipe... God could clear it all away. That's the strength that you have behind you. And mercy has no problem standing up to those boys when I'm in the room. Because she knows 100% of the time I'm on her side. And that's how God is with you. You have no problem standing to the devil with nose to nose, face to face, saying, give me your best shot because you can't touch me. Now that I've got God on my side... I'm unstoppable. It doesn't mean do stupid stuff. That doesn't mean you go out and just do crazy things. But what it means is you've got confidence that what you do, God's going to back you up. And no matter what, you're going to be okay. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what's happened in your world. It doesn't matter how bad or how good. Watch this. You can rise above. Rise above the struggle. Rise above the pain. And I believe God can do something great. Right there where you are, I want you to lift your hands all over this place. Man, if you need this prayer tonight, especially you, just lift that hand up. Every person in the room. Because maybe you're in that situation tonight. Maybe you've got no confidence. Maybe you are constantly being beat up and busted and hurt and pressed down. You feel like, man, the enemy's throwing everything he's got at you. But I got, a, I got good news for you tonight. If I came for no other reason than to just tell you that God is on your side. God is fighting for you. God is fighting with you. You can have confidence that the king of kings, that the champion of champions is standing at your side. And he is fighting in front of you. And he is fighting behind you. And there's nothing that can stop you. You can have confidence. Father, in Jesus' name, over every man and woman in this place, God, I thank you that a new confidence rises on the inside of every person in this room. God, that we are able to do the impossible, that the unstoppable, immovable, unmatched God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God, I thank you that today that same power that pulled Jesus out of the grave is available for us tonight. And God, in every situation, in every moment of our world, God, we have the ability to overcome. And not just overcome, but God, be more than a conqueror. Be greater than whatever would come against us. I thank you, Lord, God, that we have strength tonight. An unnatural strength in everything that we do. And God, tonight, strengthen our minds and give us that confidence to overcome in every situation. And God, today we give you glory and we give you honor and we praise your name. And God, we believe that all things are possible tonight. In Jesus' mighty name. Man, if you receive that, somebody put your hands together tonight. If you believe that word tonight. Look, I fully believe that we serve a God who is unstoppable and that something great can happen tonight. And so I don't know again, I don't know what you're facing, but I know the power of God. I know what he is able to do and capable of. And watch this. I, I say it all the time. God is desperate to do something in your world. He wants so badly to answer every one of your prayers. And I believe he'll do it. Watch. But you've got to believe it for it to come to pass. God's given it to you. He's got his hand out begging you to take it. But you've got to take it. And so I believe you can do it in Jesus' name. Amen. To learn more, visit WalterHallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you with your daily walk in Christ.